we uh, heard before lunch about uh, high energy accelerators or particle accelerators in the very general sense. And uh, so I'll, the, my talk will be start with a few comments on the triumph of Yang Mill theory at accelerators. And most of the talk will be about prediction techniques from quantum field theory. The very basic ideas, uh, perhaps presented in a new way uh, for some people. Uh, what we do when we're actually doing calculations that uh, test the gauge theories and other possible theories and theories of new physics, what we get when we do it and, and why we get the sort of things we get. And I'll just try, if, if time uh, permits, uh, an example of how asymptotically free gauge theories can transcend its own partonic picture by making room for new degrees of freedom. So I'll just give an example if time allows. So here they are, a few comments on the triumph of yang mills theories accelerators. High energy accelerators do offer the most direct window to short-lived quantum processes. I mean, that's what it's all about. It's the uncertainty principle. The strategy of probing matter at short distances in the spirit of Rutherford, I guess, has resulted in the identification and discovery of gauge and matter fields of the standard model. Accelerator programs, however complex and costly they may be, remain experiments following the scientific canon. They are capable of design, replication, and variation in response to the demands of nature and of the imagination. The series of accelerator programs of the past 50 years led ineluctably to the triumph of the gauge principle. And I'll review a little of how quantum field theory is applied in accelerator experiments. So we can sum up the triumph of gauge theories in the picture which appeared in David's, uh, the picture on the right, here slightly elongated for drama. Everything is kind of speeded up in the horizontal direction. Uh, or maybe slowed down. Anyway, uh, it's some, with a picture worth a thousand words, we see the gluons coming in, well, protons coming in on the far left. Uh, inside the protons are gluons. They couple through a top loop to a Higgs. So SU3 color through the Higgs goes to SU2 left and U1 right. And we see, in this case, the production of a Z and Z star into four leptons. So every observed final state is the result of a quantum mechanical set of stories, a little bit like this one. Uh, of course, the equal sign, even with the plus dot dot dots, isn't quite right. It should be absolute value squared because this is a quantum mechanical process. But uh, for, you know, bear with me for this uh, broad uh, use of the freedom of equals. Uh, and so far, the stories supplied by the standard model, built on unbroken SU3 color gauge theory, very much like the original Yang Mills Lagrangian, except SU3 instead of SU2, and the spontaneously broken SU2 left cross U1 account for all observations at accelerators up until perhaps next month. So this could be, logically speaking, the end of the story. I mean, this set of stories at the end of the story, except that, uh, well, luckily, cosmological observations strongly suggest that there are other sources of gravitation in the universe, dark matter, dark energy, and optionally, if you, depending on how seriously you want to get upset, the mystery of flavor and CP violation. The mass of the Higgs particle in the standard model, however, in isolation is unstable to overwhelming quantum corrections. And so let me make a statement which probably isn't right because I'm not a historian. This distress with the hierarchy problem of the standard model may be compared to the 17th century objections, which we tend to forget this, to action at a distance in Newtonian gravity. It comes from a profound intuition, but it doesn't immediately suggest a resolution. Putting all this aside, as the progress of science put gravitational action at a distance aside until 1915, 100 years ago, so it's about a 300-year uh, hiatus in solving this problem of uh, action at a distance, uh, the success is nevertheless extraordinary. And resolutions of the standard model puzzles, and even of dark matter, may in the fullness of time come from theories with many or most of the standard model's properties in particular, or generalizations of the gauge principle inspired by it, as we've heard earlier, yesterday, uh, like supersymmetry. But for the remainder of this talk, I'll return to how we got to this stage, how we learn to recount the stories that lead to the standard model's success.
So techniques from quantum field theory, what we do, what we get, and why we get it. And uh, okay, uh, at the short distances ex accessible to accelerators, we can expand around free field theory. The transitions between states of the free field are the stories that we use to provide predictions. So perturbation theory, I mean, everything, we always write down Feynman diagrams. And at the bottom, it's the Schrodinger equation for a state that we prepare for the mixing of free particle states. So more on this later, because it will give us already a sense of what these final states should look like. So usually, we start out with free state in boundary conditions. And there they are up there. Oh, let me try the green. Bit. Ah, there they are. It's probably the only time I'll do it without advancing the slide. Uh, so there it is, the two particles in the in state. And the notation that I'll use in these few uh, equations is Vji is just the uh, uh, vertices, what in Feynman diagram language are the vertices, but the transition amplitudes between one final, uh, free state and another, Mi and Mj. So theories differ in their list of particles and their Hermitian uh, potentials, V, the operators that mediate these changes. So solutions to the Schrodinger equation, we just saw, not surprised, they're just summed of time-ordered integrals or ordered time integrals. And this is old-fashioned perturbation theory, but it's absolutely equivalent to all the Feynman diagrams you could possibly ever write down. So there it is. It looks a little complicated. There are integrals over the time, one time for each of the action of the vertices. And then there are exponentials that just come from uh, the invariance of the theory. We see sums over, uh, over the uh, energies in, in these exponentials, which we'll uh, come to. Whoops, ah, see, I, I knew that would happen. OK, this is how you spend the whole 30 minutes. You know? So here are the energies of particles in a given state, and this is the difference of, in times between two uh, uh, you know, uh, times of the interactions that are next to each other. So generically, these sums are divergent in quantum field theory, or at least in four dimensions, because there are a lot of states to sum over. So that shows up as two of the times, or three of the times, or sometimes four of the times, well, and start to approach each other. And also, as these toss of eyes go to infinity, the one are, uh, well, it says one. There should be a two for toy goes to infinity. One are the ultraviolet divergences, and it, those are handled by renormalization, about which we heard this morning and yesterday. And the solution can be summarized in very broad terms by scaling each term in the potential by an appropriate coupling constant, g of mu, with a minimum time between interactions given, roughly speaking, by 1 over mu. In four dimensions, only the Yang-Mills theories have the property of asymptotic freedom, which, as we heard earlier, says something like g of mu goes, or it should be alpha s of mu goes like 1 over log mu. OK, g goes like 1 over the square root of log mu. So the coupling of, uh, of the standard model are either asymptotically free or small enough to not change much over experimentally accessible energy. So it's weak couplings, makes an expansion in powers of alpha s, or the other couplings like the 1 over 137, plausible, at least in principle. Once we do the expansion, the form of an ideal cross-section would be one with only a single kinematic scale to which we can set the renormalization scale. So we have a kinematic scale, and times below that, we absorb into the coupling. And so we see, here it is, an expansion that if we just do it in an arbitrary scale with the coupling, we get a bunch of coefficients that depend upon ratios of q squared over mu squared. We're just scaling out the, the dimensions of this uh, cross-section times alpha s of mu. We choose mu equal to q because this uh, is an observable. And we get just coefficients uh, of order unity, at least generically. Up oh, there we go again. Times an expansion in alpha s of q. And as q gets large, of course, alpha s gets small. The key is to find quantities that are observable in which, for which the coefficients are well behaved and don't depend upon uh, the scales mu for which the coupling is too large. So we shouldn't have a q that's too small in the case of an asymptotically free theory. So such quantities are commonly called infrared safe. For proton accelerators or hadronic final states, the problem is that there are really rather few such examples. Most of the things you would think of first are, do not have this property of depending only generically on a single hard scale. So what's the problem? Well, they're basically this is the tall goes to tall i goes to tall j problem is solved by 
renormalization, but the tau j goes to infinity, uh, and tau i goes to infinity, and so forth, problem is the infrared problem. And these are associated with what I could call mass shell enhancements in perturbation theory. So you can see this in the next uh, formula. So here is our formula again in terms of the, uh, the evolution from some state m0 to a state mn. Uh, we, we start again with the same uh, energies of a state. So it's, uh, you see in the last line there in red, the sum j and m of e of pj times the distance over time in that phase which that particular state lives. So the time integrals extend to infinity. Now, on the other hand, that's not necessarily so bad because usually you have oscillations, and the oscillations would kill these integrals as they go to infinity with some i epsilon prescription to define them, and uh, the answers are finite. Long-lived or infrared divergences come about when the phases vanish and the t integrals diverge. So when does this happen? I mean, when do you actually get a divergence? It's, well, here's the phase again, reorganized in terms of instead of having the sum of energies in the state uh, times the, the length of time the state lives, that is the distance, the difference in the positions in time of two interactions, we have the different, we can re-express that as the phase in terms of the difference of energies between adjoining state times the time at which the two states change the one into the other. So it's just a simple algebra. So the divergences in tau require two things. First, the right-hand side, okay, the, the phase in the right-hand side has to vanish. The states ought to be degenerate, okay? But that's not the only thing. The second thing is that in the left-hand side, which we could see on the left-hand side, the phase must be stationary. Otherwise, as you sum over states, you can avoid uh, this particular point where you end up with large corrections. So you demand that the integral, I mean, that the derivative of the phase with respect to the uh, independent momenta that you're summing over, which is loop momenta in this case are the same as the sum over intermediate states, uh, should be stationary. And you get this linear equation on the right-hand side here where the beta i's are derivatives of momenta with respect to, uh, well, derivatives of phase with respect to energies, and they can, if they can sit still, they're essentially velocities. The derivatives of energies with respect to L sub i's give velocities, and velocities times the time here, the set of times has to equal zero. So we have a, uh, a, a condition on the velocities. Well. With a little bit of staring, this condition of stationary phase, here it is again, uh, those in the know will recognize these as the Landau equations, uh, which are usually derived from the Feynman parameterization of, of momentum integrals. And with a, uh, a small uh, re, uh, reinterpretation of the beta mu's, well, beta mu times delta t tau, the length of time a state exists, is a difference in the positions of vertices from which the particle of velocity beta travels between time tau j and time tau j plus one. So this is a classical uh, translation. And the, uh, the conclusion of this reasoning is for infrared divergences, there must be free classical propagation as tau goes to infinity. Now actually, that's not so easy to uh, to satisfy in an arbitrary process. In fact, almost the only way you can satisfy that condition is when all the beta j's that interact as tau goes to infinity are collinear. So whenever past partons move from the same point in space-time, they will rescatter strongly, that is not as a strong interaction, but to, to produce a vanishing phase which can give an infrared divergence only with collinear moving particles and only with collinear moving particles. Uh, so let's illustrate the role of this classical propagation. So you can understand it better. You can see if you ask, well, so what? I mean, that's everything. No, it's not everything. In fact, it isn't even most things. In fact, it's almost nothing. Because if you produce two quarks, okay, E plus E minus goes to Q, Q bar. Out they come in the Y direction with a certain energy. But then you ask, oh, there's a degenerate state where they're coming in the x direction. Okay? Now, those are degenerate states, but they will never produce a long time enhancement because the phase is not stationary in the transition between moving in the x direction, or the y direction, rather, 
for some finite period of time and then switching to the x direction. So this is the reason why these collinear moving particles as you go out to infinity play such an important role. This makes identifying the enhancements a lot simpler. Here's some pictures just to show you uh, for particles moving from a local hard scattering, only collinear or soft lines. In the case of zero momentum, it's easy to satisfy a stationary phase because the derivative of a quadratic, k squared, is just k, which goes to zero. Uh, so this is uh, why only collinear or soft lines can give long time behavior and enhancement, and then it's the origin of what we call collinear and soft singularity. This generalizes any order, any gauge theory. Uh, for E plus E minus annihilation, the optical theorem uh, will tell us that the total cross-section is infrared safe. So we can calculate E plus E minus to hadrons in partonic theory and know that it's infrared safe to any order because the optical theorem tells us that the total cross-section is the forward scattering of a phot off-shell photon to an off-shell photon. But for that to happen at two local uh, points, I mean, once uh, jets would start moving apart, particles would start moving apart, they could never come by classical propagation back together again to form the photon. So it's actually, that's the optical theorem is enough. A little thought shows that you don't really need for this argument Lorentz invariant or even rotationally invariant Hamiltonians. You can truncate your Hamiltonian and say, I'm only interested in particles that are near the x and the minus x direction. And with that, non-rotationally invariant, but Hermitian, as long as it's a Hermitian, uh, 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 Hamiltonian or interaction, you're going to get the same property, and that's the reason why jet cross sections, which only involve part of the full uh, uh, Hamiltonian, are also can also be infrared safe. Well, I have a few uh, transparencies about jets, but basically, because life is short, jets, a brief biography. I'll try and do like David did last night and only like, talk really. <laughs> I won't talk fast, but I'll go through the slides fast, okay? So yeah, there were jets. I mean, you know, deep and elastic scattering, scaling, remember that stuff? Why didn't we see uh, the quarks, right? Where did the quarks go? If they acted like they were free, why didn't they come out? Well, they did because of asymptotic freedom. <laughs> and we heard about uh, Shaolin uh, Wu talk about the discovery of the gluon. So here's the story that goes with the discovery of the gluon, again, not squared. Uh, and the same picture that she showed. So this uh, was one of the uses of jets. So what we do in this case is we compute jet cross-sections directly in perturbative QCD as though the quarks and gluons were the true final states, even though, of course, we know that they're not. And the reason is because once you use uh, the uh, lack of, of uh, T going to infinity contributing to these cross-sections, you know that they depend on only relatively short distances. So an example of this is uh, cross-sections for the thrust. And, and uh, when one goes to order alpha s, alpha s squared, and alpha s cubed in these calculations, uh, you don't see formulas a lot. You see uh, numerical results, and some are shown here. And some are shown compared to uh, the data that uh, came from LEP2. And hey, you know, it works pretty good. Uh, yeah, OK. So then that's E plus E minus annihilation into hadrons and into jets. Then we can generalize that, as you do at the LHC, to uh, situations where you start out with protons. OK, so the problem with uh, protons is that uh, they allow the, or the good things, they allow scattering of quarks and gluons from pre-existing hadrons, for which interactions extend back to the time of nucleosynthesis. So there's no getting away from T. If not T goes to infinity, at least T goes to minus infinity, or well, far enough. You know. So OK, in this case, what you try to do is what we call factorization. You separate your short distance. Uh, so here it's called sigma hat uh, cross-section from something long distance. The new physics is in sigma hat, or the short distance physics, which is where we expect to find new physics. And the long distance physics you try to make as universal as possible. Now, this kind of factorization is uh, required for almost all collider applications. And what we do, OK, so here's what we do. We compute the cross section, the physical cross section on the left and these long distance pieces on the right in an infrared regulated variant of quantum chromodynamics, either yeah, typically, it's dimensionally continued quantum chromodynamics, but there are other possibilities. 
where we can prove the factorization explicitly. And then we extract sigma hat, assuming it's the same in true QCD as in its in infrared regulated cousin. So caution, the proof often depends on being inclusive in the final state, and the form of factorization may depend, in fact, in general, does depend on the measurement that's at hand. So extending standard calculations to exotic measurements may lead to problems. An enormous amount of work has been put into these calculations with fruitful interplay with string theory uh, through duality, and we heard about that also in, say, for example, Heinrich's talk and, and uh, also, to some extent, in Lars' talk yesterday. So here's just an example of the kind of formula that comes out. You see, there's a sigma hat. Uh, I'm talking into this, but it's not necessary. Uh, can you still hear me? Yeah. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> Okay, so you see sigma hat is an expansion in alpha s over, k, uh, alpha s over pi to some power k, and this is just a piece of, of the coefficients that you see here in terms of the so-called plus distributions, generalized functions that you need to combine uh, contributions with different numbers of particles in the final state. All righty, moving right along. Uh, real quick, people hear about uh, evolution. You have to evolve things like parton distributions, these F long distances, FLD, are parton distributions. So here it is, real quick. Whenever there is a factorization, there is an evolution because the scale you introduce to separate the short distance from the long distance is not a physical scale. It's out at our disposal. Therefore, the derivative of the physical cross-section with respect to that scale is zero. And that means by separation of variables that the derivative of the log, the logarithmic derivatives of the short distance part and the long distance part depend only on the variables they hold in common, which in general are things like in dimensionless variables like x, so Feynman x, and alpha s of mu. We can calculate p because it's the logarithmic derivative of the short distance part, and we know how to calculate that well uh, after some work. So, then you've got these two differential equations and you solve them and that's evolution and variance of that factorization give you things that people call resummation and it all works real well. There's a solution. Hey, that's pretty quick. Uh, and it, it like really works well. On the other hand, um, you know, it's kind of neat that the original slack experiments were right here. Here's scaling. Okay, this is one of these things, I forget where it was, where people say, well, if the world had been a little different, you know, Newton would never have seen the apple fall or something like that. I mean, we were a little bit in that situation here about seeing the scaling like this. This is still weak scale breaking, but it's still, it's, it's dramatic. And of course, the great successes have to do with this transition from scaling to scale breaking, which uh, took over 10 years, but now is, is dramatically. Okay, so here is a factorized cross-section of the type you would see at the LHC, uh, a sigma hat, an integral over the Xs, which are the, uh, uh, the parton fractions, and we have to sum over A and B, where A and B are gluons, they're quarks and antiquarks, whatever you got, you know. Uh, of course, it'd be nice. So, hadron, okay, can't help it. Back in the, you know, so where did it all come from? These uh, jets back then, the real applications of this really showed up in the mid 80s around the time that uh, Mike was uh, showing that uh, you, know, you could use lattice QCD to, to prove or demonstrate confinement. Uh, and here we have an example of the scattering of quarks as seen by UA1. And this really put quark-quark scattering on the map and showed that partons acted like free particles in all of the channels that are prescribed by quantum field theory. And of course, now we get up to a TeV. The only thing I want to emphasize on this slide is that events at the scale of delta x about 2 times 10 to the minus 19 meters are observed about 10 meters away. So we got 10 to the 20 in the experiments that are done at the LHC. And that's a pretty big number. I mean, you know, it's not the blank mass, you know, but it's pretty good. And well, OK, we already saw these in <laughs> David's talk. Uh, but uh, they're still really neat, the kind of jet cross-sections you have. And here on the bottom is, is a test of this Rutherford cross-section uh, that comes from saying the basic thing that happens is that a gluon is exchanged. OK. I didn't even see the five-minute thing. All right. Oh, what am I wasting time for? Oh, and the other life of all this, since I'm from Long Island, I have to show something. Well, actually, it's Atlas, but uh, you know, it's uh, the 
uh, the other life of jets is shining from the inside to see what happens when you create this hyperdense matter from colliding to nuclei. And uh, also in cold nuclei, there's some uh, fixed target experiments, but also uh, now we're seeing uh, this program to have a uh, electron ion collider, so one of the future projects. So back to factorization here, uh, here's the factorization. Five minutes remaining. Okay, folks, you only got five more of me. Uh, <laughs> lucky you. Um, <laughs> here we have a general cross-section A plus B, which would be P plus P at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, the story is that you start out with uh, parton distributions. You have the thing called C, which is our sigma hat, and then you produce a whole bunch of uh, partons going out, and these are represented by functions that describe the dynamics of the jets. So what we have here is correlated and autonomous dynamics. The dynamics of the jets are autonomous. They factorize from each other like the part-time distributions factorize from each other. But we have some sense that this is happening because of this enhancement that we see in, uh, that we identified before by asking general quantum mechanical questions. And the reason why the uh, dynamics remains autonomous is basically uh, simply uh, can be thought of most simply in terms of classical fields. Uh, here I'll just, uh, if you ask what happens when one charge uh, either approaches or, uh, re uh, or uh, goes away from another charge that's stationary, what you realize is that the, there's a uh, uh, Lorentz contraction of the physical fields, like the E, which we're thinking of here is the electric field, even though uh, uh, it decreases with 1 over gamma squared, where gamma is the Lorentz factor, at any fixed time after the point of closest approach. The electric field is seen by receding particles. It's highly contracted, falling off as 1 over gamma squared once it passes by. And that classical feature of gauge theories is at the heart of factorization. On the other hand, it gets really complicated when you try to look at it in, in, in terms of Feynman diagrams, because if you look at the gauge field itself, it turns into a pure gauge and isn't Lorentz contracted at all. In fact, you know, it's not even like a ruler. I mean, this, it's really, it's really gets to be hard in terms of proofs of factorization in uh, perturbation theory. So, uh, but when you look at it in terms of you, in, you, you really ask yourself, what is the consequence of the Lorentz contraction of the, uh, of, of the physical fields, the electric magnetic field, you find that corrections to the autonomous, that is factorized distribution, description of high energy processes are power suppressed in momentum transfers. So actually very, very large suppression if you choose the right thing. In QCD, here's a picture of how things work. Uh, on the left, so this is an amplitude times, there's the word times, a complex conjugate amplitude, where you have a, a gluon which say is getting collinear the gluon K is getting collinear to P, and you have interference with three other possible places that the gluon could be emitted from. But when it's parallel to P, the sum of these three diagrams is independent of the other momenta and only depends upon P. And that's a, just a ward identity of, of the theory and a basic feature of gauge invariance. So in QCD and other gauge theories, the scalar polarized vectors give non-factoring contributions that grow with energy in individual diagrams. But in gauge invariance, ensures that they simply organize themselves into gauge rotations on physical particles. And so you encounter Wilson lines or non-abelian phases, as Frank called them. Uh, so such results typically point to how perturbation theory transcends itself, making room for the true long-time behavior of the system. That's the last thing I wanted to show, is what it looks like when you start asking about these soft gluons, which attach to Wilson lines, or well, we'll call them Wilson lines. And by just using a certain amount of rather elementary algebra in coordinate space, which is, goes by the name of shuffle algebra uh, to the mathematicians, uh, one can show that uh, an interesting quantity, so I'll just close with this interesting quantity as the, the last point that I wanted to make. You have the product of two Wilson lines with uh, light-like or nearly light-like momenta. They are the exponential of an integral over positions on the Wilson line, starting at zero and going out to infinity, or back to minus infinity, 
of a single function of alpha s, and this function only depends upon the product of these two coordinates. It's not a function of anything else. It's just a, a, an expansion in alpha s. And in fact, this expansion in alpha s, there's, there it is again, that's the same formula in red, uh, and weak coupling, it starts out, it's a cusp anomalous dimension, but also in dimensional regularization has corrections of order epsilon. So if you look at this integral, those who looked at duality discussions of it, you know, within the past decade, a surface interpretation of this integral, of this result, is tempting, and a QCD uh, coupling runs, and I'm out of time. <laughs> And uh, so it's, it's uh, simply, well, let me just say that it's interesting that the scale at which alpha s is to be uh, evaluated as you integrate over this surface is, uh, it, it, it's the minimal uh, distance to a five-dimensional surface in the duality argument. So I come to my conclusions. Uh, accelerators have confirmed the fundamental degrees of freedom in gauge theories of the standard model directly relying on methods of Infrared safety, factorization, evolution to complement and motivate the great technology that lies beyond, behind them. QCD, however, transforms its degrees of freedom on length scales beyond nucleon scale. For the most part, observations are, that we have so far are designed for identifying partonic states in an effort to detect and reject also QCD backdrops. The history of QCD jets and the evolution of partons, not patrons, into hadrons is there for the reading, if only we can learn the language. On the last point is time will tell whether gauge theory is accessible to accelerators were also a resolution to dark matter mystery, as it did for the then exotic particles and cosmic rays, and later for neutrinos. I hope so. Anyway, thanks. Congratulations uh, to the inventor <laughs> of this theory. Congratulations to everyone who works on Yang Mills theory because there's a lot, a lot of future to this field. So. Yeah.